to. As Rosemary shared with the children, John the Baptist's message was prepare the way. And in Advent, it's a great reminder. In Advent, it's a great reminder, friends, that just as John the Baptist prepared the way, was called to prepare the way for Jesus to come on earth, so we are called to prepare the way for Jesus to come to people now. We are called to prepare the way for his return. That is part of our call. See, Advent is really a powerful reminder of that calling that we all have. It was a calling that God entrusted to us, you know, at creation. And a calling that Jesus restored to us when he died on the cross. And that's what I want to explore a bit today. So we're going to actually reflect on all of the four readings in the lectionary today, starting with Psalm 72. And the words will be on the screen. We're going to read Psalm 72, verses 1 to 7, and then 18 to 19. And this is a prayer that the people of old prayed. They prayed, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the kings in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that watered the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. And then verse 18, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. What's going on here? This is a prayer that the people of old were praying. They were praying for a righteous king. They were praying to Yahweh for the kings, that the kings, their kings would rule with justice, that their kings would rule with righteousness. And the reason they were praying that prayer, because their kings weren't ruling with righteousness. The kings weren't ruling with justice. They weren't caring for the poor. They were oppressing people. They were, in the eyes of the Scriptures, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. We heard that for king after king after king. And so they were praying, they were praying that kings would rule in righteousness and justice. The people prayed this would happen. Why were they praying for it to happen? They were praying for it to happen because that prayer was in accord with God's will for his people, that they would care for all people. God created his people to love, to care for each other and to care for his creation. That was a call that God put on the heart of all people at the very beginning of creation. And God has never revoked that call. He's never revoked that call. Listen to the call. This is in Genesis 1.28. It's on the screen. And God blessed them. And God said to them, this is after God had created all the heavens and that and created man and woman in his image. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish and over the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on earth. Right there at the beginning, God gave us our vocation. He made it clear what we're called to do. He created this beautiful earth. He created people and we are to have dominion over. What does that mean? To rule over creation. He entrusted us to rule over his creation. Of course, all of that went south when humans rebelled against God and sin entered the world. But God never revoked that call. As a result of sin, evil prevailed on the earth and we had the flood. And after the flood, we had the Tower of Babel, 
a sign of human pride and arrogance. Let's build a tower to the heavens and make a name for ourselves in direct disobedience to God's call to fill the earth. God called us to fill the earth, go out. We wanted to stay together. And of course, he confused the language. But in spite of all of this, God never revoked his call. He never revoked that call. And he spoke it afresh to Abraham. Isn't it interesting? The Tower of Babel is in Genesis 11. In Genesis 12, we have the call of Abraham. And listen to this. Listen to what God said to Abraham. It's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. It's on the screen. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonours you, I will curse. And listen to this. In you, Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God was going to renew that vision where all families would be blessed. That would have happened if sin hadn't entered the world, if humans had had dominion over the world and continued to live with harmony with God and harmony with nature and harmony with each other. But that didn't happen. But God was again raising up a man through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed and everything that the Lord did following, friends, was moving towards that. Rescuing the people out of slavery in Egypt through Moses and leading them into the promised land where he could call a nation to himself who would be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles. That was the plan of God. That was the heart of God. The people, though, wanted kings and first God, God gave them the kings and initially... They ruled well, not perfectly, but King David ruled well. And his son Solomon, not perfectly, but ruled well. But after that, it all got messy. There was division. And that's when, as I said before, we read again, king after king who did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And hence the prayer of Psalm 22. Oh God, give us a king who will rule with justice, who will rule with righteousness. They were longing to see the fulfilment of the promise to Abraham. But friends, this prayer was also a prophetic prayer. A prayer for a king who would come. A prayer for a king who would come and would rule the earth with righteousness and justice. And that's the king prophesied by Isaiah in that reading that Bernie read at the beginning. The psalm was like a prophetic prayer of a king who would come. And as through the prophet Isaiah, he said that out of the stump of Jesse, a king would come. That is a king in the line of David would come. And let me just recall again what we heard read at the beginning. The king who would come, there would rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding. of counsel of might, of knowledge, of the fear of the Lord. He, this is a king who would judge with righteousness. And then you, that beautiful vision that when this coming king fully rules, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the calf and lion together. A vision of creation restored. Because remember, when God created the world, there was no evil, there was no violence. This was a vision. When this king came and when this king would fully rule, the harmony that was there in Eden would be restored. It would be restored. And it was John the Baptist who was given the task of heralding the way for this king to come. Prepare the way of the Lord. Preparing the way for the king to come. But you know what? Even John the Baptist couldn't fully comprehend what sort of king this king would be like and how he would rule. Even John the Baptist, he did a great job and in obedience to the Lord he prepared the way, but he couldn't fully comprehend, nobody could, how Jesus would rule. Here again what John the Baptist said, as he said, prepare the way. This is what he said. 
He's meaning the one who would to come, meaning Jesus. He's winnowing fork in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And can't you just hear him saying that? It's obvious from his life. That may have been just the way John the Baptist was. It may have been his personality. Maybe he was a demonstrative animated personality like me. I don't know. But, but the language did not reflect how Jesus would come. Jesus did not achieve that through being a violent judge, but by a forgiving, loving, accepting, suffering servant king whose strength was found in his meekness, wasn't it? Sure, judgment will come. The wheat and the chaff will be sorted. Jesus himself talked about the sheep and the goats. God the Father will ensure this will happen, but it will happen as people choose to embrace his love and his peace and his joy and his healing will be saved. And those who reject his invitation tragically will be lost. But do you hear that? It comes. People bring judgment on themselves. Not a fiery God who will do it all, but rather judgment is rejecting God's invitation of love. Isn't it? And that's what Jesus demonstrated. Peace will come. The wolf and the lamb will lie together. Fear will be banished. Harmony will be restored to creation. And the coming of Jesus represented the beginning of that restoration. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. The fullness of that vision in Isaiah, that full restoration will only come when the king returns to earth. But the transformation has begun. When Jesus came to earth, that transformation began. And it continues through us. It continues through us. We are the ones, friends, through our worship and our service, we are the ones who worship and serve towards their ultimate fulfilment when harmony in creation will be restored on earth. That's the promise. And so Advent is a time, yes, if we just concentrate on the fact that when it was about Jesus coming, we've missed something important. Advent is about us. The message, prepare the way, friends, is about us. And this is why. And this is really important. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he not only saved us from our sins but he restored our true vocation. We concentrate, we so often say Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Yes, he did. But he also, through his death on the cross, restored that vocation that God gave to us a creation. How do I know that? The word of God clearly said it. Listen to this. Let's have a look in the screen in Revelation chapter 1. From verse 5, as John is talking to him in his vision from heaven and it's reflecting on Jesus. And they sang a new... Oh, that's right, yeah. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of earth, listen to the next bit, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, but it doesn't then yeah, end there, and made us a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion to ever and ever. Did you hear that? He saved us by his blood and made us priests. In Revelation 5, 9 to 10, we hear it again. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the, cro uh, to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain. 
And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God. And they will reign on earth. Did you hear that? They will reign on earth. What was the call of God at the beginning? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. And here again, he's saying, those I've rescued... I've made a kingdom of priests and they will reign on earth. 2 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do you hear that? Jesus on the cross, friends, restored our true vocation. Why? So that we may be able to prepare the way for him to continue to come into people's lives, that we may prepare the way for him until that time when he returns to earth and the kingdom will reign fully. He called us to do that. What, what do priests do? A priest represents the people to God through worship and intercessions. That's what we were doing before as we were praying for all these people. That's one of our priestly tasks, interceding, representing people to God. But a priest also reflects God to people. Doesn't he or she? Represents God to the people. That's what Jesus called us to do. We are the ones in our priestly role to reflect God's love to people, reflect God's grace to people, reflect God's healing power to people, reflect, reflect God's deliverance to people, God's compassion to people, God's joy to people, God's hope to people, and all that Jesus demonstrated when he reigned the earth. So how do we prepare the way? We prepare the way, friends, by fulfilling our priestly calling, a calling that Jesus restored to us on the cross. And more than ever, God needs his priests on earth. God doesn't need people who think, oh dear, the world's a terrible place. Oh dear, there's more horrible stuff happening. Thank goodness I'm saved. I'll come to church and I'll worship him and I'll wait till we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. And this world sucks, but thank goodness heaven's waiting. God does not need Christians like that. They are not the Christians he called. That is not the commission he gave them. And for far too long, the Western church has been God's frozen people, not God's chosen people. Haven't heard that one for a long time, have we? <laughs> it's true. One of the things were going well, but then it got all mucked up. And religion and Christianity became, it became um, acceptable. And ministry became professional. And as long as you showed up, gave your money, worshipped and tried to stay out of trouble, earth became like a holding pattern until you got to heaven. And that undermines and diminishes what Jesus did on the cross when he hung in agony. He restored us. To be a kingdom of priests, he restored that vocation to fill the earth, subdue and rule and bring God's harmony and God's peace and God's hope. Jesus did not bypass us and is not, God is not bypassing us as he is transforming the world and making all things new. He is calling us to be a part of the process. We need that more than ever. And clearly, even in the time when Paul was writing Romans, that wasn't happening. And it's not happening now. The reading from the epistle or the letters in the lectionary is from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 to 13. Listen to what Paul is writing and praying for the Roman Christians. From verse 4. For whatever was written... 
in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, listen to what he says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it was written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people extol it him. And again, Isaiah says the root of Jesse will come and he will arise to rule the Gentiles in him will the Gentiles hope may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope so why was it that Paul was quoting scripture after scripture after scripture to convince the people to show the people that God was going to speak through the Gentiles that God was going to care the Gentiles why was he doing it because it wasn't happening why was he saying that praying may you through endurance live together in harmony and welcome other and other as Christ has welcomed you? Why was he doing it? Because it wasn't happening. There were Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. But Jesus didn't come to create Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians. Just as he didn't come to create Catholic Christians or Protestant Christians or Pentecostal Christians or whatever Christians. He was challenging them because they were thwarting their capacity to do what Jesus commissioned and called them to do. They were not able to fulfill their priestly role of representing him to the whole earth because they were too busy guarding their own turf and protecting out of their insecurities their own rules and rituals. They were so busy defending what they had that they lost sight of the vision of the redeemed of a redeemed world, and they were called to be part of God's transformation of that world, so that more people would come into His kingdom, and more would come to know the hope beyond the things of this, the finite things of this world. Every tribe. What do we read in Revelation? Called from every tribe, language, people and nation. Brothers and sisters, there is so much work still to be done. Ultimately, God will do it. But as I've said before, and I'll say again, God has chosen us to be part of the process. God never revoked his call on us to rule and reign and reflect his reign on the earth. As Paul said in Timothy, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And it's not a reign of, hey, look at me, but a reign taking the burden of responsibility the burden of responsibility that that entails of sharing the mantle with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords until he returns. You see, this is a powerful reminder that we don't fulfil that calling as a bunch of individuals doing their own thing, but as the church his body as we fulfill our priestly role we have different gifts as the holy spirit gives and when they work together the holy spirit creates a synergy that's far greater than the parts and that wasn't happening in rome and it's not happening now but the more the church 
serves in harmony, loves and celebrates and comes together in harmony. Not uniformity. Doesn't mean we all have to be the same, but in unity. Unity is not uniformity. Doesn't mean unity doesn't mean we need to just all worship the same way and all do the same things and all come together. No. That's uniformity. Unity is about a hard issue, about being able to genuinely love and celebrate our diversity, but move forward with one common heart and vision. The call, prepare the way of the Lord, is resounded together collectively, not individually. That's why Paul was urging them, live in harmony, endure, live together. And I want to read again the last words in that passage. Paul prayed, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that how? By the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And what did John say as he was preparing the way for Jesus? I baptise you with water. But he that will come will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The only way we can do this is through the Holy Spirit. The only way we're really able to rise up and fulfil our priestly role and to serve together as a church in harmony is through the indwelling presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This sounds more like a Pentecost sermon than an Advent sermon, but really when we get a grip of what Advent really means for us, it is a Pentecost issue. We need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We need to continue to ask, not just once, but to continue to ask for a fresh baptism, a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. More, more, more of his spirit so that we can reflect more of God, more of his power, more of his love, more of his grace, more of his healing. We need more of him to be able to do this. Why? Because this is Advent. Prepare the way of the Lord. In our, high pri in our priestly roles, we are called. Through we are, through the relationships we have, through the contacts we have, through the friendships, through the family, right where we are to represent Jesus, to be prepared to represent him, that he may choose to work in and through us to bring about his purposes until that time when all things are made new and his kingdom is fully realised and the fullness of of the kingdom of God again prevails on earth. We're in that time and we're part of this. Advent is not just about, it is about Jesus coming, but it's about us. It's about us hearing afresh our call.